Hope and Shadows by Stephen Little Chapter 22 Rescue at Demon's Run Part 2 Sir, I don't mean to pester you, but when are we going in? Prince Shining Armor has been holding the line for more than a few minutes now, one of the Lunar Guards asked. Why are you asking me? I'm not in charge, Soren replied. Begging your pardon, sir, but you are the highest-ranking pony here. That puts you in charge, Major, the Knight Stallion informed him. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Autumn Shade, sir. Soren took a quick look at the stallion's armor to find his rank. I guess I have no choice, Captain. Analyzing the field of battle quickly, Soren came up with the best he could on short notice. Captain Shade, when I give the order, I want all Pegasus to fly straight at the enemy air support. And I don't mean take your time. I want every Pegasus flying like a bat out of Tartarus. But do your best to stay in line with each other. Just before you reach their line, I want the left half to veer down and loop back up, around to attack from above and the right to spread out to fill the gap in our offensive line. Is this a battle strategy or a cloud ball play? One of the stallions from behind asked. Shut up, Starlight, or I'll replace you with your sister Starbright. She at least knows when to keep her ears open and mouth shut. And besides, it would work for both, Autumn Shade told him. The point is, we need to control the skies. With Onyxian dealing with the dragon, it'll be up to us to take out the rest of the flyers. With any luck, the Solar Guard will see what we are doing and press the attack harder on their front. Being attacked on the side front and from above should disorient them enough for our Pegasi to knock them out of the air so the unicorns and earth ponies can clean them up. Soren explained. So what are we waiting for? McIntosh asked. It looks like Armour is holding his own, but Onyx looks like he's in a bit of trouble, that big bastard's got a bite on him, and his left wing doesn't look so good. I know, we just have to wait a little longer. There, Shining Armour has the last of his stallions off the hill and into the valley, Soren shouted. Every pony line up and remember the plan. On my signal, Pegasi move out and the rest of you follow at full gallop three seconds later. Every stallion seated in front of the Pegasus saluted smartly. Sensing that the time was right, Soren ordered his troops forward. The pegasi of the Lunar Corps spread out, their wingtips almost touching as they flew swiftly towards their intended targets. Any pony unaware of the events in the valley ahead would have sworn they were watching a Wonderbolt air show. The bat-winged Lunar Guards flew in perfect formation with the precision of flying veterans. The squadron of dark stallions sped towards their targets at an incredible speed, closing the gap between the warring parties quickly. Soren's Pegasi descended upon the unaware enemy flyers like bat-winged angels from Tartarus. The plan was executed exactly as planned. The left wing of the advancing Pegasi broke formation, went under their targets, banked up, then came down upon their enemy like a hail of arrows, knocking many from the sky instantly, others hovering in shock, not knowing what to do, many of those being knocked to the ground shortly after. As the Pegasi continued to buck and punch their enemies from the sky, the ground ponies drew close to the action. Charging their way to their enemy, Big Macintosh and the stallions galloping behind him broke upon Blueblood's forces like the waves that crash upon a rocky shore. As the earth ponies and unicorns of the Lunar Corps went to work on their untrained and ill-prepared foes, a mighty explosion and white-hot river of fire erupted from the side of the castle near its base, causing every pony and dragon in the area to freeze for a moment and look towards the glowing red hole that marked where a column of flame once was. Soren shouted down to the soldiers under his temporary command. Don't just stand there! Keep fighting! Things for Onyx had not been going as well. After trying to stay out of the larger dragon's claws for what seemed like hours, the black dragon had started to tire and Strike had gotten in a lucky blow, using his tail like a cudgel to bring the smaller dragon out of the air. The black dragon had gotten in a few good blows against his advisory, but the larger dragon was clearly better at fighting, having torn one of Onyx's wings and giving him a nasty bite on his back and neck. Standing over Onyx, the larger dragon chuckled cruelly. 
You have some nerve to challenge me, Whelp. However, you lasted a lot longer than I expected. But then you young worms are always trying to take down your elders. Now, let's see. What should be your punishment? Traditionally speaking, I should kill you immediately. After all, you did challenge me to single combat. And I couldn't let my honor go unsatisfied, now could I? Go to Tatarus, you butcher! Onyxian hollered at him. A butcher, am I? Well, then, perhaps I should just mess you up and let you live. Let me see now. Your left wing followed by your right, then your tail, maybe. Of course, I could always just take your wings and legs and let you squirm across the ground like a snake. How does that sound? Fuck you, you murdering bastard! It's monsters like you that give dragons a bad name. If it wasn't for you and your ilk on the council, the dragons might still be sought of as scholars and the holders of ancient wisdom, not bloodthirsty savages. Onyx spit, hoping to catch his tormentor in the face. Strike Redclaw was, if nothing else, self-assured of his own greatness. When the explosion from the castle grabbed hold of every pony's attention, it grabbed hold of one other. When Strike looked away for a second to find the source of the blast, he was surprised to find a set of razor-sharp teeth dig into his throat. Onyxian clamped his jaws securely over his rival's throat and bit down hard. Strike struggled to free himself, but Onyxian only bit down harder. To give Strike something else to worry about, the smaller dragon dug one of his hind legs into the monster's shoulder and began to claw at his adversary's underside with his other. Strike knew he was in a compromised position and was done for if he couldn't get the upper claw soon. Desperate to get away from the Onyxian, Strike rolled to the left and thrashed about on the ground to get away, but it was already too late. Onyx had an unbreakable grip on the large dragon's throat, and it was only a matter of time before the black dragon's black claws had scraped away the smaller scales protecting Strike's stomach. When Onyxian realized that one of his claws had found purchase in the mercenary's hide, he dug the claw in and ripped it down, disemboweling his adversary. Strike was growing weak, either from the loss of so much blood or the pain of his injuries. He could hardly put up much of a fight. Stepping off of the other dragon, Onyxian jumped to the other side, took the back of Strike's neck into his jaws, bit down and twisted sharply, snapping the mercenary's neck. With a mighty bellow, he signaled to Shining Armor that the threat of Strike Redclaw was over, allowing the stallion to focus more intently on the battle before him, while the black dragon took a moment to lick and cauterize his wounds. The roar had alerted more than Shining Armor. Indeed, every pony, griffin and assorted creatures stopped dead in their tracks when they saw the lifeless carcass of Strike Redclaw laid out on the ground, torn open from chest to hip. Many of Blueblood's forces had only agreed to fight for stallion dominance because they believed that with this massive dragon on their side they could not lose. They would be assured a victory that would give them a greater stake in their country and, as a stallion, a greater say in all matters. With their champion gone, many of the rogue stallions had begun to lose heart. At first it was only a few, and then more, before long any stallion that was not in the custody of the royal guard seemed to be beating a full retreat back to the castle. After the unicorn that Shining Armor was dealing with ran for his life, the general had a chance to have a good look around, with most of the adversaries beaten or running. Shining Armor called out to his troops. We have them on the run. Press home our advantage and pin them against the castle. This day's ours. How long are we going to be wandering around in these corridors? Gertrude asked. And weren't we supposed to be rescuing the kids while you guys took care of this? Yes, and that's still the plan, Sprinter admitted. However, I don't think you'd have much luck getting to them while Null Spark is still casting his spell over the room, so Buford and me are going to take care of this while you four go get the kids. I only hope that the princesses and the others can get to Blue Blood and keep him from disappearing. But I thought I was going with you and the bug, Vanel protested. Excuse me? 
the changeling asked, a look of indignity on his face. Drop it, Buford. It's not important right now, Sprinter said, trying to get control of the situation. Sorry, Miss Vinyl, but after thinking about it a bit more, I've decided that the two of us can handle things while you go with your wife and the others, just in case they run into any surprises on the way. I guess that's cool and all. I wanted a chance to knock some heads around anyway, Vinyl admitted. Vinyl, this is serious. Our daughter's life may be in jeopardy. How can you joke around at a time like this? Octavia asked. The white unicorn fixed her with a steely gaze, the red eyes shining above the rim of her shades. What makes you think I'm joking? If I find even one hair out of place on my lady's head, Blue Blood will hope the princesses get to him before I do. Penelope cleared his throat, breaking the tension of the moment. Mistress, I suppose we should be going. Where is their room again? Down the hall, a second right will lead you to the secondary receiving hall. The kids are in the third room on the left wall, Sprinter informed her. All right, then. You boys be careful and meet us in the throne room when you are done, so we can plan our next step, Gertrude suggested. Will do, and you ladies be careful as well, Buford told them. As the stallion and the changeling watched the other four members of their party depart, he turned back to his compariot. Well then, how much longer till we get to this null spark? Actually, we are there. He's in the second room on the left, Sprinter informed him. You could have told us that a little earlier, Buford said, trying to keep his voice down. I'm sure he knows we're here by now. I doubt it, Sprinter told him. He's in a special soundproof room so he can concentrate on casting his spell, keeping the kids helpless. I seriously doubt he could hear a cannon go off outside the door. So how do we do this? the changeling asked. As quickly as possible, Buford. Tell me something? Sprinter asked. Can you change yourself to look like Blue Blood? Buford smiled, suddenly understanding what the stallion had in mind. Yeah, if he looks like that picture they showed me back at the palace, I think I can do that. Gertrude, Penelope, Octavia and Vinyl slowly made their way down the hall toward the secondary receiving hall of the castle. Even though they were cautious when turning corners and took care to watch out for guards or other stallions wandering the halls, they found the castle conspicuously empty. Okay, this makes no sense whatsoever, Gertrude said, quickly looking around the corner into the receiving hall. There isn't a stallion in sight, not a single guard. I know what you mean, Vinyl agreed. I mean, if we're even close to where they're holding the kids, you'd think they'd have at least one guard around here somewhere. Rounding the corner into the receiving hall, the three ponies and Griffin noticed again that there wasn't a single guard on duty. Are we sure this is even the right hall? This blue blood doesn't sound like he's dumb enough to leave his hostages unguarded. I can understand why you say that, but you don't know him like we do, Penelope, Octavia told her. Blue Blood is an egoist of the highest caliber and coward, to be sure. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he had his stallions either on the field of battle or guarding him. That being said, he has been known to be fairly devious when he puts his mind to it. If he put any foresight into this at all, it would be wise of us to treat carefully lest we are caught off guard by a trap or hidden guards. Hey, Gertrude, why don't you check those doors over there? Vinyl suggested. Oh, that's real funny, the Griffin said, her voice dripping with sarcasm. No, seriously. If it is a trap, you can just hide behind the door, and if there's a guard or something, you could just take them out. Unicorns have to charge up offensive spells, and I'm pretty sure you're quicker with those blades than any of us could be. You have a point, although Penny is pretty quick with her up here. Okay, I'll check to see if the kids are in any of those rooms. The rest of you should keep a lookout to make sure no pony drops in on us. I think Sprinter said it was that third door, but I'll check them all just to be sure. Gertrude told them. Checking the first two doors, the Griffin found only empty rooms. When she approached the third door, she very carefully cracked the door ever so slightly and looked in through the narrow crack she made. Inside, she found all the kids and other captives surrounded by four stallions in lunar armor. 
Closing the door as quietly as she opened it, she silently called the other three to her. I found them, and Penelope was right. He didn't leave them unguarded. There's at least four guards in there with them, Gertrude whispered to them. I'm sure we can take them out, but I'm afraid they may grab one of the kids before we can get all of them. Then here's what we do. Gertrude, you, Penelope, and Octi rush the room and get everyone out, and I'll keep the guards busy, Vinyl said quietly. And how exactly do you plan on holding that since the magic is being blocked in the room? Octavia asked. Simple, Vinyl said. As soon as you three bust through the door, I'll grab the stallions with my magic and freeze them in place. As long as I stand outside the room when I do it, I shouldn't be affected by the anti-magic thingy, the white unicorn said, proud of her plan. And if you can't hold all four? Gertrude asked. Well, um, I guess you can have a crack at whoever doesn't get frozen, Vinyl told her, trying to keep a genuine looking smile on her face. But remember, Apple Bloom and three of her guards are around here somewhere, so don't kill anyone just in case one of them might be our friend. The small group of rescuers kept close to the door, inching the door open ever so slightly. Vinyl was able to see the location of each of the guards. Every pony ready to do this? she whispered. Gertrude and the other two nodded. The white unicorn took a deep breath and took the plunge. Letting as much magic as she could muster enter her horn, she cast a paralyzing spell on the four guards. Penelope kicked the door open and charged into the room with Octavia and Gertrude in her wake. The scene was pandemonium. The sudden entrance of the four rescuers and the blue glow around the guards had sent the captives into a scared panic, believing Blue Blood had found them out. Gertrude and Penelope split up as soon as they had entered the room, the mare heading for the children while her mate checked to make sure the four guards were restrained. Octavia made a beeline for her daughter, tackling her with a crushing hug only a mother could give. Melody, Melody, my baby, are you okay? Are you hurt? Mother, mother, what are you doing here? Did they capture you too? Melody asked, hugging her mother with a desperate need. No, baby, we're here to save you. Her mother answered. After making sure everyone was secure, the griffin pounced to the middle of the room. Octavia is quite correct. The lovely mare of there's Penelope. My name is Gertrude, and we'll be saving your flanks today. Now that that's out of the way, would you all kindly stop panicking and tell me if there are more guards in this room or coming to relieve these booze on soon? Gertrude, Penelope, is that really you? Ditsy asked, not believing her eyes. Yes, Ditsy, it's us. The doctor asked us to help rescue you and the rest of his family. I guess he finally got around to telling you how he felt, Penelope said. Yeah, this is all very nice, but we really need to get going, Vinyl informed everyone as she walked into the room. Vinyl, don't, Octavia called out. If you enter the room, the spell will be blocked. It was too late. The white unicorn had already entered the room, however, the spell was not cancelled, as they previously believed. Huh? Vinyl said. I guess Sprinter and old Cheese for Legs took out what his face that was keeping the magic off in here. Question is, what do we do with these guys? She said, indicating the four paralyzed guards. You should probably let them go, since they're on our side, Garnet told her. That's Apple Bloom and her guards. Vinyl quickly released her spell and the four ponies she held. Sorry about that, guys. Apple Bloom quickly removed her helmet, revealing her true form. Why in Equestria would a radio DJ have need of a paralysis spell anyway? The yellow mare asked a little indignantly. Fans and groupies can get rough, the white unicorn explained before turning to her wife. And you said I was being ridiculous and paranoid she said, sticking out her tongue at her wife. Octavia just shook her head in embarrassment. Now that the magic's back on, the first order of business is getting these kids out of here, Apple Bloom said, scratching the back of her head with a hoof. Dusk, Don, how many others can you teleport? Well, if Don and I pool our magic... Now, wait just a moment. If you think for even a second that we're going to just take off to save our own flanks, then you've got another thing coming, Dusk said irritably. That's exactly what I want you to do, Vinyl told him. I want you two and every pony here out of harm's way. 
I'm not leaving until get Ruby back, Rarity insisted. What are you talking about? Things can be replaced, lives can't, Penelope said, unsure about how any pony could get worked up over a piece of jewelry. Penelope, Dinky said, walking up to the mare, Ruby is Rarity's newborn daughter, not jewelry. A couple of hours ago we were called out of the room to be questioned about the tactics being used by our troops on the field, and while we were distracted, Blue Blood grabbed Rarity's foe for what he called added insurance, Applebloom explained. I don't think he'll hurt her if he's using her as a bargaining chip. Fine, Rarity, you can stay, but the rest of you should go, Gertrude said. Almost immediately there was a dissension amongst the others. The entire room erupted in an awful din of argument. Enough! Octavia shouted. The abrupt outburst was enough to bring the quarreling to a sudden halt. Composing herself quickly, Octavia adjusted her pink bow tie and addressed the room. I know that you all want to help, but in this instance... It would be more of a hindrance to have you here. If Blue Blood or any of his cohorts were to get a hold of any of you again, he could use you as leverage against us. If you really want to help, then go. It'll do us a world of good to know that you're all safe. Octavia's right, but I'd like Belle, Garnet and Scudalo to stay. They're all experienced fighters and can be of use. Agreed, Vinyl said with a nod. It's not happening, Aiden stated calmly. Apple Bloom was about to say something when the prince held up his hoof. I agree the children should go. This is no place for them, but I have as much a stake in this as you, and that goes double for my cousins. Blue Blood is not just leading a revolt against Canterlot. This is an assault on my family. And while I appreciate your help and willingness to risk your lives in the defense of our country, for Dusk, Dawn and myself, it is our responsibility to fight for our subjects, lest they fall to Blue Blood's designs. Dusk stepped up beside his cousin. Aiden is right. There comes a time in the life of every ruler when they must leave the throne and take up the sword in defense of their people, and while none of us currently sit on the throne, the point is no less valid. Dawn walked to the other side of Aiden. More importantly, Ruby is in danger and she's as much our family as you are, Rarity, and we will not turn and run when a member of our family is in danger. Dawn said resolutely, Applebloom, I know you and I have had our issues, but right now I don't care. We are going and that's final. The yellow mare was obviously upset about Dawn's defiance, but before she could say anything, Penelope spoke up. What about you, Ditsy? Do you have anything to say about this? I'll be going with the children, Ditsy told them reluctantly. Rarity, I hope you don't think bad of me, but some pony needs to look after the little ones. Octavia, you were right. If I'm here, Julian will only worry about me. Dinky and little Ginger Snap. So we'll be going, and I think Tootsie Flute and Melody should come too. I'm not going, I'm staying with Dawn, Dinky announced. I understand if you feel you need to go, Mom, but I'm staying. And so am I, Tootsie Flute announced. If Dusk is willing to risk everything for his family and Equestria, then so am I. Besides, what if some pony gets hurt? They'll need some pony here to help the injured. Fluttershy is here, she can take care of it, Vinyl told them. I'm sorry to be the wet blanket here, but time is running out and we need to get back to the others, Gertrude told them. Fine, come if you're coming, but if I tell you to get down, then you sure as tatters better get down, Apple Bloom told them, the tone of her voice leaving no room for argument. Yeah, yeah, whatever, Apple Bloom, Jato said. Me and Honey are going to kick flank and take names. Oh, hell no, you are not dragging my cousin into this. Pinky would never forgive me, and you and Brayburn already have some issues. You want him mad at you again for putting Honey in danger? You let me deal with my dad, Apple Bloom. I'm staying, and so is Jato. Our parents are element bearers, and if we cut and run, how would that look? Honey asked. My parents always told me to stand up for what I believe in, and I'm not going to run away from some overstuffed jerk just because he thinks mares are mean to him. Fine, Apple Bloom said. But you two stick close to me, and I mean what I said earlier. I give you an order, and you'd better follow it. Melody sidled up to Aiden and lightly tapped him on the shoulder. If it's okay with you, I'd like to come with you, she told him. 
Octavia and Vinyl were about to protest when Aiden shook his head slowly. No, Melody, you should go back with Mrs. Ditsy and the children. The poor white mare was shocked by the prince's words. You mean, you don't want me with you? I thought, I mean... Melody was interrupted by a sudden kiss to her forehead. Melody, you are a very special mare, and I would never forgive myself if something happened to you. But I want to help you, Melody said softly. Melody, can you fight? Have you ever been in a fight? I'm not saying this to be mean, but that's what's happening here. We are going off to fight, and to be completely honest, some of us might not make it back. I have no idea what I'd do if you were one of them. Aiden told her, leaning closely, he whispered into her ear. Besides, Miss Ditsy is going to need help. It's just going to be her with the children, and even though she's masking it well, she's scared to death, so please go with them and help her, okay? Can you please do that for me and your mother's? Okay, but you totally owe me dinner when you get back, and you had better come back, she said, giving him a chaste kiss on his cheek. Taking her place with Ditsy and the children, she waved goodbye as dusk and dawn teleported them back to the castle nestled in the Everfree Forest. As the ponies walked from the room they were imprisoned in, Aiden found himself flanked by Melody's mothers. Thank you for that, Aiden, Octavia told him. I feel much better knowing that she's safe. That being said, Vimer piped up, what exactly are your intentions towards our daughter? I assure you, madam, my intentions are pure. I have no intention of plucking her innocence. After all, we only had a few days to talk and have not even been formally introduced. Of course, when all this unpleasantness is over, I will formally be asking for permission to court Melody, he told them matter-of-factly. Hey, Ugly, didn't you say something similar to my parents when we started dating? Vinyl asked. Indeed, and if I remember correctly, that was the same time you convinced me to stay the night at your place, Octavia said, staring a hole through the younger stallion. My daughter is a lot like Vinyl, and even though I gave in a little easier than I should have, make sure you are more resistant than I, she told him, driving the point each time with a poke to the chest. The throne room was empty when Celestia and her small party entered, trying to stay as quiet as possible, lest they alert Blueblood's guards. Twilight stood by the door, waiting for the last pony to enter, and as soon as she closed the door, she quietly trotted up to Celestia. As long as we are waiting for the others, this is a good time as any to ask you about the book. The Princess of the Sun swallowed hard. She knew this day would eventually come. She simply wished it had come much later. What book might that be? There are so many. You know very well what book. The book your mother gave to Clover. The book that is engraved with our cutie marks, Luna's and that of my five friends. I know Clover told you about it, and surely you were able to open it. I want to know where it is and what it says, Twilight told her. I know that it holds the truth of my life, of all our lives. Don't ask me how, I just know. Yes, Twilight, Celestia said, hanging her head. You are right in a way, but it's not much more than that. Even I don't know all its secrets, but if you would accept my help, then I will do whatever I can to assist you. That would be an interesting change of pace, Twilight said with a half a smirk upon her face. I just want to know why you couldn't trust me with this book. My mother left a note inside that told me not to reveal any of this to you until after a struggle that would test the ties of family. At the time I first read that, I had no idea what it meant, but now I think it refers to our current situation. So you knew about me even before I became your student? Twilight asked, confused and a little upset. Not in so many words. Mother was always cryptic in those ways, but her book told me of signs to watch for, and that they would lead me to my greatest student. I have to say I was not disappointed. Twilight blushed slightly. As I said before, Twilight, I will show you everything I have, and all that I know about the book when our families are safe and this current threat has been nullified. Agreeing to table the issue for now, Twilight decided to wait for the others in the company of her wife. Is everything all right, dear? Luna asked her. 
I guess for now anyway, but after this is all over, I don't know we'll have to see. Twilight said, a depressed sigh escaping her lips. What bothers you, Twilight, other than the current situation? Her wife asked. It's complicated, but after this is all said and done, Celestia and I are going to be investigating a book I think your mother wrote, and if I'm not mistaken, it tells in minute detail everything that has led you, your sister, and even my friends and I to arrive where we are in life. I'm worried about what exactly I'll find in those pages, she said, nuzzling against Luna's shoulder. Fear not, my love, for I will be there with you. Together we can weather any storm, she told her lavender life mate. The party did not have to wait long before their worries were slightly calmed when Gertrude walked through the main doors of the throne room. Turning back to the hall she just came from, she called to those behind her. Hey, guys, I found them, so stop worrying, she threw the doors open wide, allowing those behind her entry into the throne room. Parents saw children, children saw parents, and in what can only be described as two stampedes headed for each other, the two small parties collided. Dusk, Dawn, what are you still doing here? Luna asked, through a cascade of happy tears. Being smothered by you, that's what, Dusk said, smiling as Tutsi Flute was being given the same treatment by her own parents. Aiden, I'm so happy you're all right. Cadence exclaimed with joy. I'm fine, mother. You can stop crushing me now, the white stallion said, trying to escape his mother's hug. Hey, where's Sprinter and the back gotten off to? Gertrude asked. We are right here, Buford said, as he and Sprinter walked in through one of the chamber's side doors. Dinky, where's your mother and Ginger? Julian asked, almost frantic with worry. Dusk and Dawn sent her back to the royal residence with all of the children, the grey unicorn told him. She didn't want you to worry about them, and she wanted to make sure the other children were all right. Oh, thank goodness. I love your mother, Dinky, but I feel better knowing that at least she's safe. Oh, I brought you a little something from the workshop, just in case you needed it. Awesome, break it out. This one got a little damaged when we were brought here. Dinky told him, anxious to try out the new replacement leg. If Toffee and Chase are always ditzy, then that's fine by me, Applejack said, heaving a sigh of relief. It sure does take a load off of my mind to know they're safe and sound back at home. Fluttershy nodded her agreement. Well, that doesn't explain why you two are still here, Rainbow Dash said, her and Pinky scowling down at their children. Come on, Mom, like we'd ever abandon you in a fight. We're family, and the family that fights together, stays together, or something like that, Jato told her. Yes, sweetie, something like that, Honey told him before Pinkie Pie enveloped her in a crushing beer hug. Oh, my precious baby, I'm so happy you're okay. You have no idea how worried I've been, Pinkie sobbed. Oh, Mama, it's okay, I'm fine, I wasn't hurt at all, she said, trying to console her grieving mother. Rarity and her two children walked up to Celestia, Kiran at her side with Scudaloo, Applebloom, and the three Luna guards kept a lookout. Your Majesty, is there any word on Spike? she asked hopefully. I'm sorry, my dear, but we've not seen him and Emerald is still searching the castle. The princesses looked down on the forlorn unicorn and noticed something missing. Rarity, where's Ruby? Did she return with the other children? No, Princess. Blue Blood has her with him. Shortly before Octavia and the others arrived to rescue us, he took her as an added insurance, Rarity explained. Oh, Princess, I'm so worried. There's no telling what Blue Blood might do to her. Kieran could see that the unicorn's mind was concentrating on more than the safety of her child. I would tell you not to worry, Rarity, but false hope can be cruel in its own way. However, I can promise that we will do whatever we can to return your fall to you, the Draconicus said, trying to reassure her. I take it that Gertrude told you about what we found earlier? the Solar Princess asked. Rarity could feel the tears welling up in her eyes. Yes, on the way here she told me of what you found in the cell they were holding my spike. It's horrible. How could any pony commit such horrible atrocities to another living thing? It's not that hard once you get the hang of it, 
Blue Blood said, stepping out from a secret door behind the throne, along with fifty of his private guard. Not wasting any time, the would-be king's forces surrounded the room, taking up positions at every entrance and exit to the room.